Ew, gotta get rid of this old Backstreet Boys t-shirt. Tell me why. Because it stinks, boys. Tell me why. I've washed it so many times, but the odor won't come out. Tell me why. No, you tell me why I can't get rid of this odor. Have you tried Downy Rinse and Refresh? It doesn't just cover up odors. It helps remove them. Wow, it worked, guys. Yeah. Downy Rinse and Refresh removes more odor in one wash than the leading value detergent in three washes. Find it wherever you buy laundry products. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Emma Maynu and Adrian Milner, about the recent report, Mental Health at Work, The Cost of Coping. Emma Maynou and Dr. Adrian Milner, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, John. Looking forward to it. It is a pleasure to have both of you. You're joining us from the UK. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be focusing on a recent report out by your company titled Mental Health at Work, The Cost of Coping. A super important topic we all know over the course of the pandemic. uh, We've seen all sorts of challenges around mental health uh, related to the social isolation and just all of the challenges, the social, the political, the the workplace challenges that people have been facing. Uh, So we're going to dive on into this and have a really great conversation. As we get started, I wanted to share both of your bios with everybody. Emma Maynou, worked as a senior level marketing professional within global brands and agencies for a number of years. This brought great professional reward, but at the same time, she was hiding in plain sight while living with anxiety and depression. In 2012, she began a healing journey, which she later shared on her mental health platform, Surviving Sundays. In 2019, Emma became a qualified mental health first aid instructor. And today, through the Utopia Mental Health Practice, Emma drives healthier cultures across organizations as diverse as Spotify, TikTok, Rakuten, and eBay. Dr. Adrian is a research and impact director at Utopia and an expert in policy addressing race, ethnic, sexual, and other types of societal and organizational inequity. Her passion is utilizing empirical evidence and quantitative methodology to drive and measure positive change. Dr. Milner is also an honorary senior lecturer at Brunel University London and has authored two books and 40 plus peer reviewed publications related to equity, diversity, and inclusion issues and policies. Both have just a tremendous background. I really appreciate you taking time to share your expertise and experience with me and my audience. Anything else that either or both of you would like to share by way of your personal background or personal context before we dive on into this report and really talk about the topic for today? No, you pretty much nailed it. Thank you. All right, let's dive on into this report. And I always like to ask whenever I'm interviewing an author about a book or a new report that is released. Why did you write this? Why now? Why this study? Why now? Why is this important for us? And why do we need to be paying attention to it? So the why really is kind of obvious in a way. I feel like whether you were in the workplace or whether you've been out for dinner with friends or whether you're watching the TV, there were two words that we kept hearing in the last few years and they were unprecedented and uncertain. And that has been constant. It's continuous. It's still ongoing. What was less certain was the impact that that was having on people, just living in these unprecedented and uncertain times. And I'm in the business of going into workplaces all over the world, 
day after day. So I could be up early doors doing a session for Asia and one in the evening. And although cultures and experiences are different, there was one thing that was the same. And it was very clear that people were, there were three words I kept hearing, overwhelmed, tired and anxious. Now, we might have a moment in our lives where we're feeling a bit overwhelmed, but three years of consecutive crises, cost of living crisis, um, increases in hate crimes, discrimination. It was just so much. And we could sense it and we could feel it. Whenever I went into sessions, I could feel it. Although in those ways, it's obvious when you're in a room. Sadly, employers get hung up on evidence and data when it comes to mental health. Where is the proof that I should be investing in this area? Where, you know, what will the ROI be? And it's interrogated, unfortunately, unlike other areas of business that I've worked in before. I worked in marketing. Best part of my career was in marketing. And you always had to prove your ROI, especially if you're going to do something big and sexy. But I've rarely had something interrogated, like I need to prove it as much as I do when I go into a workplace and ask somebody to really invest. I don't just mean for one day of the year, really invest in a strategic long-term mental health program. And so I thought, you know what? You want evidence? We're going to give you evidence. So that is the why. We wanted to create something that leaders would listen to um, and that would really represent the experiences of these these people that have just been living through these difficult times and showing up at work. That's why. Yeah. Great, great. And you're absolutely right. I mean, it's so evident to people, just interact with people, talk to people, be in the same room as people and have just a normal human conversation with people. And you'll see this. Um, Yet we also simultaneously live in this hyper um, data analytics driven environment where everyone wants to see um, quantitative evidence for everything. And on the one hand, that's frustrating. On the other hand, it makes sense. And so you're, you're um, speaking the language, right? That uh, people want to hear that executives are kind of demanding. Th- and that's, uh, you know, why you're, you're putting the effort into reports like these. And, and I think that's important because it will capture a different audience, different group of people that might otherwise not pay attention to what you have to say. Uh, so I think that's uh, fantastic. Uh, and can I just add to that, John, as well? Oh, yeah, like- go for it. One of the like really difficult things, you know, people want this data, they want the insight, they want, we know, and the report has proven as well, your people are suffering, but they're not telling you. And often people are living with depression and anxiety, but they may not go and get a diagnosis. So as much as leaders want evidence, it's one of the really hard things to create safe spaces in organizations for, for that evidence to emerge organically and um, safely. So that was a reason, another reason why a report was needed, because you can say all you want. We talk about mental health here, but people don't feel safe. You know, you're not going to know the real picture of what's going on in your organization. So we wanted to provide a clearer picture for those people. The other reason is that we're also an inclusion company and we know that the most minoritized people are suffering because of it's not just the pandemic. We had, you know, everything from George Floyd to the cost of living crisis to to war, to environmental crises that are, again, impacted the most environmentally um, vulnerable, which are poor people, which are people of color. So mental health is not separate from inclusion. Mental health and psychological safety is a part of inclusion. And it is also related to especially those, again, who are the most minoritized, who are the most, most vulnerable, and who have suffered the last year in terms of something like COVID-19, where people, um, communities of color had, had, you know, substantially more disparities in terms of death and illness. So that was another reason as well, is to link mental health with our focus on inclusion and diversity. As you were both describing that, you know, I couldn't help but, but think of adjacent, but slightly tangential kind of a topic. And that's related to neurodiversity in the workplace as another, you know, one of those categories as we think about inclusion. And this is something I've I've done quite a bit of work on in my own research uh, around autism uh, and autism in the workplace. And I did a big study a few years ago, and I'm sorry for to to kind of get us off track a little bit, but I think it's relevant to what you're both just saying. And I did a big study uh, a few years ago um, you know, trying to understand what organizations, what, what senior leaders in organizations, how they were thinking about autism in the workplace, what types of mechanisms were in place, uh, the policy practices and procedures to create a more inclusive 
uh, welcoming environment, one where um, those on the spectrum could thrive in their places of work. What we ran into uh, over and over and over again are organizations saying, yes, this is important. Yes, this is something we want to pay attention to uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, it's not the kind of thing that a lot of people self-report. And, you know, I can't, you know, I might be able to observe some traits or behaviors that might give me a clue as to whether someone is on the spectrum. But unless someone self-identifies, I don't know for sure. And then am I going to be able to support them the way they need to be supported or create the kind of inclusive environment that we need to have um, so that they can thrive? Um, so that was a, a challenge because self-reporting is really, really low for people who are on the spectrum. Uh, and then organizations just saying, you know what? This, while this is important, this isn't like in the top 100 things that are most important to us. Um, and it's, this, this is a fairly small group of people. And so, you know, they didn't have any bad feelings towards them or they weren't wanting to discriminate actively to, against them. Um, but they just weren't willing to go further, right? Uh, and because they just didn't see why, why it was so important. And all of this gets back to what you were just describing in terms of mental health, because so much of it is is suffered in silence. So much people will not actually open up and share, especially if there isn't already an inclusive environment where they're al- given permission to be vulnerable or they're given permission to express and to, to openly share and self-divulge um, what they might be struggling with. Uh, so, you know, in some senses, it's a bit of a chicken and an egg kind of a situation. People aren't going to to share unless there's already an inclusive environment. If there's not an inclusive environment, how do you create that psychological safety so people are more willing to share? And if organ- if leaders, if senior leaders are only willing to act if and when they see the the um, the data uh, to to say this is really really important to our people, um, then when are we ever going to get there? It's like the cycle of like non-reporting and then feeling like oh there's not enough need and so we're not going to pay attention to this right. Hundred percent, and I think that the consequences are kind of there right now. They're happening. Um, there's been a long tail of people feeling either silenced, um, ignored, unimportant, undervalued, um, and overloaded. And what we're seeing is something called the Great Resignation. That's people who are just leaving their jobs, not always with a job to go to. In times, you know, of great financial crisis and worry, people would rather not be in their job than suffer the way that they have in the work that they they've been doing. And so much of this has been preventative. But again, um, people just being, you know, either told that you know something isn't that important, or we do something one day a year, being the focus, has meant that a lot of people have kind of flown under the radar, so to speak, um, and they're now making the decision to leave. So let's get into the report a little bit more. What what do you think are the main takeaways, the main findings from this report? So there were a few key findings. Uh, the first thing is that more people are experiencing poor mental health than we ever could have imagined. Uh, this is a UK report. And when we went into this, we had knowledge of a UK statistic um, that has been used for, for, for some time, which is that one in six adults of working age experience mental health issues in any year. Uh, we found that actually more than four in five workers' mental health had declined due to external events in the last two years, but also three in four impacted in the workplace directly as a result of workplace issues. So for us, it was, wow, okay. these issues. So are- 75%, 80%, these are crazy numbers. Yeah, really, I had really to. Good. I thought I miscoded something. You know, I always obviously check my coding and, and my and my analytics when I'm when I'm doing any sort of report. But this one, I had to check double the amount that I usually would because the numbers were so shockingly high across the board. Yeah, and I think it's really important to note at this at this point that the next question. I mean, it's honestly like you're in a court of law sometimes when you're presenting this data in an organization. I mean, not from this report, but when we go in and we have these conversations and we might have some insight that people aren't doing well. Okay. So you've just heard from the people that that have mental health issues. Actually, you couldn't select to come into this report because you have mental health issues or are passionate about mental. This was just a completely open um, forum for, for anybody that we kind of recruited 
Adrian, do you want to say more about like who was able to? Sure. So the company we partnered with to get our sample of 3000 participants, which is which is a fairly large sample, um, you could only self-select out of the survey. So actually, people might have self-selected out if they were triggered about talking about mental health. You could not say, oh, I'm interested in mental health. Oh, I have had a mental health issue in the past. Or oh, I know someone with a mental health issue. You could only select out once you found out what the topic was. So, so yes, it, that, was, that was, again, a really important element that you couldn't participate just because of your own relationship to mental health and work. And I think it's yeah. really, sorry, also, just to, just to add here, I think it's really important that we clarify what we talk about when we're talking about mental health issues. Um, we're talking about serious issues here. We're, t- we're talking about people experiencing symptoms of anxiety, symptoms of depression, symptoms of overwhelm, but also some people reporting that they felt um, that they would be better off dead um, and had thought about harming themselves repeatedly in the previous two weeks. And that was not an insignificant number. Adrian, did you want to say more about that? Yeah, it was about, again, this was one that I thought this can't be right. I have to go back to the original data. It was 34% of our sample thought about hurting themselves or that they would be better off dead at least several times in the past two weeks from when the survey went out. So this wasn't during the pandemic. The survey went out in August, this past August. So, you know, again, those numbers are absolutely shocking that people are feeling this. And when I discussed them with friends and family, people all said, actually, that doesn't really surprise me that much. You know, and the more, the more I talked to people, the more they said, well, thinking about it, no, I'm, I'm not that shocked. And again, these conversations just aren't happening with leaders, with people running organizations that they would think that people, again, these are employed people. These aren't, these aren't highly vulnerable people without employment that their employees might feel like this. I just don't think um, leaders and businesses have this information. So another reason, you know, that, that we're really happy to share this report because now hopefully yeah. they'll be inspired to do something about it. Well, yeah. And, and when I said a few minutes ago, like that, those numbers are shocking. It's, they are shocking, but on the other hand, like you were just saying, Adrian, it also, immediately passes the sniff test for me because as I've interacted with people over the last several years, I'm like, well, yeah, pretty much everyone I know <laughs> has had challenges and issues. Uh, and so it is shocking and it's, it's troubling, uh, but it's not surprising uh, because we've all lived it. We've all experienced this. Uh, and so, so yeah, it, it, it just highlights how hard it has been the last few years uh, how hard it continues to be for people and why leaders and organizations need to be paying close attention to this. And I think there are things that are in the hands of leaders that came through in the report as well. We can talk about, okay, so we know who's struggling, but why? Okay. Um, so COVID um, and the cost of living crisis came out really high um, and this is, you know, we've got people in jobs, some of them in very high paid jobs, some people even working in the finance sector, um, disclosing they're in well paid, worrying about their bills, but also having knowledge that COVID is going to rear its head again in winter. And also that some people just aren't afford to have have the heating on. So compassion for others being something. But also there are things that are directly within um, a leader's um power really to address one of the big things that came through over and over again was the need for psychological safety in teams the need for managers to have skills training the need for managers to be able to give space to these important conversations and not to invalidate and dismiss people and put profit before people those are all the things that in the hands of of the workforce they may not be able to control um, things like covid or a cost of living crisis but there are things that you can do in your organization to help people's mental health to to be better with it within the place that they work any major surprises from the report something you weren't expecting other than the shockingly high numbers yeah i think it was for me the fact that this is actually leading to the great resignation, as Emma suggested. So we know that people are resigning. And the story that was told coming out of that was just that COVID gave us more purpose. It, it, you know, alerted us to the fact that life is precious. We spend a third of our lives at work. Let's find somewhere that, you know, I feel valued or I feel, you know, I'm, I'm, 
I'm committing a purposeful um, act in, in my in my career. But this report is showing that 32% of our sample considered or actually left their job specifically because of the relationship be- between the way the work that w- that their work negatively affects their mental health. So they're citing that it's not just, okay, I'm, I'm going to get a better job. It's actually because the way that my work is impacting my mental health is causing me to actually leave. So I thought that was an interesting sort of take on the great resignation that, that I wasn't sure that people would cite their mental health at work as the reason for wanting to leave their job. People have reframed this, you know, the great resignation, the great reawakening, the great reevaluation, right? All these different ways of framing. A lot of these reframings are mental health related, right? Like people are taking stock of their priorities, their values, what's most important to them and, and how this translates over into their personal lives, their daily lived experience, both, you know, at home with family, with friends, et cetera, but also in the workplace. And that's why so many people have made the active choice to, to go a different direction, to try something else. In some cases, you know, start their own business, you know, do a side hustle, uh, you know, whatever uh, the case may be, um, because they weren't willing to kind of make that those sacrifices that maybe pre-pandemic they were willing to make. They thought it was necessary, to, you know, to get them ahead in their career. And now they're just, they're, they're realizing, ah, eh, life is too short. Uh, you know, uh, there's so much craziness in the world. Everything's so complicated and messy. Why, why would I suffer through doing something I hate or something that's not fulfilling or meaningful or whatever? Um, and, and if people are struggling day in and day out with, with anxiety and depression and some of these, you know, uh, suicidality or, uh, you know, self-harm or those sorts of things, you know, yeah. I mean, I think people need to take stock and, and make, uh, make moves that are going to help them be in a healthier place. Uh, and so I, you know, I've heard so many senior executives kind of lament this whole idea around the great resignation or, or talk about entitled employees, people not willing to, you know, put the work in. I think the whole conversation around quite quitting, you know, for the most part, it really bugs me um, because the whole time people are talking about it, I, it mostly in, the way I've heard people talk about it, it's, it's the framing around, you know, people uh, not willing to put in as much time and effort as they once used to. They're quietly quitting. That's, you know, that's an employer kind of way of framing it from an employee side. I'm thinking, why would I uh, endlessly sacrifice myself on the altar of my career? You know, when the company's not committed or loyal to me, they're not investing in me. They're just wanting to, you know, turn more, get more out of me, produce more from me constantly. And I'm not willing to put in 60, 70, 80 hours for a job that isn't meaningful or fulfilling. And I, you know, is just kind of sucking the life out of me. So why wouldn't I recalibrate? Uh, and, and if, if employers are, are frustrated by that, they need to take a good hard look, I think at job design and their organizational design uh, to make sure that they're doing things that make actually make sense in the modern work world. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, talent retention is, is a huge deal to employers because employee turnover is one of the most costly problems a business can have. And something that came out of the great resignation in our data was that it's the number was about 32% for the whole sample in terms of those who considered leaving or would left their job, <clears throat> excuse me, because of the relationship between mental health and work. That number rose to 50% for LGBT participants and for disabled participants. So you're talking about retaining talent, but now we're also talking about retaining diverse talent. Then these measures really need to be put in place. I was just, I was just thinking that, you know, I, I've lived with anxiety um, the majority of my life. It's something that I'm just very used to kind of living alongside now. It's not something I think will ever leave me. It's just part of me. And as much as I grappled with mental illness in the last few years, um, I also tasted mental wellness a lot more not having to run into the city making the choice to actually relocate out of the city being able to do things like not have to sit in a a meeting room where I felt stifled and actually be over zoom and sometimes to have my camera off and to work in a business where I can say do you know what today I'm not feeling so good I'm going to work later in the day and I think that 
there are other people that maybe had some similar experiences of connecting more with nature on those days where we were told we were allowed to go out for an hour's walk. We savored it, right? Um, and I think that as much as there has been challenge, there have been things that have shown us another life that is possible. And therefore, why, you know, we talk about quiet quitting. Um, people have come to appreciate things, small things, that they never appreciated before. And I think that therefore they're setting their own rules. And I think that's fair. And long overdue. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so too. Setting your own rules, setting your own boundaries, re- reprioritizing, aligning your life with your core values. I mean, those are all great practices for a, a good mental and physical life, you know, mental and physical health and, and living the good life. And so uh, I, I, I would definitely encourage everyone listening to do that for themselves, but I also, you know, most listening to this are, are leaders themselves. Think about what you can do to create that psychologically safe place where people, where it's truly inclusive, where people do feel like they're valued, that they're needed, they're wanted, uh, that they're given an opportunity to contribute in meaningful ways and where they feel invested in uh, on a continual basis it, create that environment. And then you can actively <clears throat> proactively Provide the support that your people are going to need. We all need it. 75%, 80%, those numbers that you presented. I mean, that's basically everybody is struggling. Everyone has um, the things that are challenging to them and and particular groups, are those numbers are even higher. And so let's make sure that we're paying close attention to this. Well, it has been a real pleasure, Emma and Adrian. I know we've just scratched the surface. There's so much more we could dig into with this report, um, but we're going to have to have to leave it there for today. Before we wrap things up, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team, where they can find the report, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. So you can kind of reach out to us um, on email at towardsutopia at weareutopia.co. Um, the report also can be found, you can download it on our website, uh, which is weareutopia.co. So you can reach us um, via those ways. Um, and also just to say to you, thank you for giving us this space to talk about this report today. It's one thing to kind of have it out there printed and circulating, but quite another to kind of give it some richness and context in a conversation. Um, so thank you. Thank you both. Again, I encourage my audience to reach out, get connected, check out the mental health at work report in its entirety. Um, Please utilize it. Please uh, think about these things carefully and implement practices in your organization to promote the positive mental health and uh, uh, successful, healthy living of your people. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. If you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.